G'day Jap Adventures, Terry King here. Welcome to the channel and welcome to another short tech video. Today in this freezing Queensland morning, I'm going to be replacing the coolant in this 200 series Land Cruiser. And from those of you who come from colder climes and think, hey Terry, don't be a wuss, it's not that cold. You know what? You're right, I am getting soft. So I'm at 160,000 kilometers and it's time to swap the coolant out in the cruiser. Now before I do that, I'll just go through really briefly some of the chemical natures of the coolant you can get for these cars. Back in the olden days, the old green coolant that you got to, you know, 25, 30 years ago was an ethylene glycol based coolant and it was an inorganic acid technology coolant and that had a reasonably short shelf life on the stuff and the reason for that was it was quite conductive, it could conduct electricity and you could get these galvanic responses between different types of metals. So for example, between cast iron and aluminium. And that was the reason you had to change it over reasonably quickly. And if you left it for too long, it could actually start corroding parts and it would really discolor too. You could get a rust color in your cooling system. And then in the early to mid nineties, they brought out an organic acid technology coolant, which lasted a lot longer and it didn't have quite as much galvanic reaction as the IATs. And those coolants are still used today. And now in modern times, you've got a third type of coolant called the HOTS, the Hybrid Organic Acid Technology Coolants. And they've got silicates added into them, which the OATS don't have. And they're your longest lasting coolants and they are the most effective. They've also got minimal galvanic reactions. So in a car like the Glen Cruiser, for example, where you've got different metals, you've got cast iron and you've got aluminium parts that the coolant's exposed to, you want to reduce that galvanic response as much as possible and the HOTS allow you to do that. So for me, that's the one that I'm going to choose. Now, if you're thinking, Terry, what the heck do you know about coolant chemistry? Well, listen, I'm not a coolant scientist or a coolant formulator, but I did do a university degree in chemistry. So I've got a little bit of an idea of what's going on. And that's the HOTS that I'm going to be putting in the car. It's the genuine Toyota coolant and it's the super long life coolant. Uh, they've got a long life coolant as well, which is an oat, and the hoat is the super long life coolant. The only downside to this stuff is it's dear. I've got myself 20 liters of it, and it costs just over 100 bucks for 20 liters. But if you think about it, that's reasonably cheap insurance. You know, you got a car, a $50,000 plus car, you've done all your work to it, you've got it all set up the way that you want. Why would you skimp on something like that that would potentially jeopardize the longevity of your car? It's just not worth it. So peel the dollars off your wallet, go out and get the good stuff. All right, let's pop open the bonnet. And what Mr. Toyota has done is they've actually got little instructions here on how to change the coolant, which is handy. Um, it's not completely comprehensive, but it'll give you a really good start. So the first thing to do is pop off this shroud. Now you may not have to do that, but for me, I can't actually see the Toyota coolant lines on the overflow bottle because I've got a larger battery in place. So I've got to pop off that shroud so that I can get down in here and see those coolant levels. Now you'll note there are two bleeders. Here we are looking on the top of the radiator and bleeder number one is here and it's just got a little 3 8 inch square drive on it. And our second bleeder is located near your dipstick. And what I'll do is I'll actually pull off this intercooler shroud just to allow me to get to it a little bit easier. just two 10 mil dome top nuts that hold that intercooler shroud on. And as you can see, it's a little bit easier now to get to that bleed valve. All right, first things first, take off the lid off the overflow bottle. Now I'll pop the car up in the air and I'll start draining the coolant. So the first thing we gotta do is take off these bash plates. Oh, 
Okay, we're on the underside of the car now, and there's two areas to note. That one there is the drain or the stopcock for the bottom of the radiator. And just here beside this cooling unit, that little guy there is the drain for the block itself. So you got a little 10 mil bolt on the end of that. You just loosen that off to drain the block. And of course the stopcock on the radiator is just a little threaded unit, little plastic unit that you'd unloosen. So let's do that now and let's start the drain. Okay, let's crack this sucker open. Okay, now we'll crack this little sucker on the engine block. Well, that's what our coolant looks like that we've pulled out of the radiator so far. That's excellent. I can see down to the bottom of the bucket. So there's no real visible contamination like particulate contamination in there, which is great. All right, we'll nip this bung up now. Not a lot of room to swing a wrench in there. We've got our engine block drained. We've got our radiator drained. I will drop the car back down and top him up. Okay, before we fill up our radiator, we've got to crack this bleeder. And this will just allow air to escape out of the system. And the other one we've got to get to is this sucker on underneath the intercooler. So that's what she looks like. Just a little blank that fits over top of that tube. So I pulled 10 liters out of the coolant system. It's got a total capacity of 17 liters. Now this car is fitted with the rear AC, which is the reason that it's got that capacity. Now I'm going to fill it up with 10 and what I'll do from there is I'll reduce my service interval. So rather than changing the coolant every 160,000, I'll reduce that interval down to, call it 100,000. If you wanted to get that full 17 liters out, you'd have to top it up, run the system, and then drain it back out again, and attack it like a dilutionary type effect. Now, the other thing I've done is I've got the front end of the car jacked up, and it's sitting about three or 400 mil in the air. And the reason for that is I want to get this radiator higher than the bleed valves. And of course, while I'm filling it, I'm keeping an eye on those bleeders to see whether any coolant's coming out of them. All right, the overflow tank is full, so we'll just let that slowly trickle down into the system, and we'll top it back up slowly after that. So I've just started to see some coolant come out of that bleeder, so we'll cap him off now. Pop our clamp back on. Like so. I haven't had anything come out of that bleeder yet. The back bleeder is now capped off. So what I will do is close this off, start up the motor and get the engine to operating temperature and then let her cool down and check the system again. What I will also do is I'll hose down the motor where I've got some coolant that's sort of dripped about here and there, just to make sure that when I check it after it's cooled, I'm looking at, if there is a coolant leak, I'm looking at a fresh coolant leak and not one that's been there from me spilling. All right, that's the underside of the car hosed off. Let's go take her for a ride and get it up to temperature. Let's get this sucker up to operating temperature. Turn the rear heaters on, and that'll get coolant flowing through the entire system. It's still only up to 60 degrees C. Normal operating temperature for this truck's around somewhere between 78 and 82. Bounces between those two marks. All right, we're up to 80 degrees C, which is our normal operating temperature. We'll head back home, we'll let the system cool down, and we'll top it up with any additional coolant that it might need. Alright, we're back home. 
The engine is up to full operating temperature and you can see that the overflow bottle, which was full when I left, has dropped down to just below the full mark. So we'll let that entire system cool down. It'll probably draw down a little bit more of that fluid. We'll top it up and Bob's your uncle, we're done. So our engine is cooled down. I've topped up the overflow bottle. It needed to take another two or three hundred milliliters, so not a lot. And this is the underside. Just checking for any coolant leaks. That's our engine drain valve. That's our radiator drain valve. Well, that's it, folks. That's how you change the coolant in your VDJ 200. I trust that was of some use for you. If you're enjoying these videos, give a thumbs up, share with your friends, and we'll see you on the trails out there sometime. Keep the shiny side up, everybody. Have an amazing week. Bye now.